Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Accounting Tax Compliance in Microsoft Dynamics NAV. We're excited to partner with Avalara to bring you this webinar. Today we have Stacy Dose, our Strategic Alliance Manager from Avalara, joining us to present. Stacy is a great resource as she brings a unique background of working with users just like you as a consultant and a vendor. First, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the question box and we will get them called out and answered for you. And secondly, we do record this in all of our webinars. If you want to view the recording or have someone else in your organization see it, you can find it later this afternoon at anovia.com. And now without further ado, Stacy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. Good morning, everyone. As Andrew said, my name is Stacey Dozy with Avalara, and I'm here to talk to you today about sales tax. How exciting is that? So first, I want to talk about our agenda. We're going to talk about some of the compliance challenges that you may face as an organization, why location is important when you're figuring sales tax, some other taxability troubles that you may encounter, um, the automation advantages, so why it pays to automate when it comes to sales tax, tax, and then we'll do a short demo at the end. And of course, we'll have time for questions. So first, let's talk about some compliance challenges. Um, the struggle is real. I mean, sales tax is a definite struggle in a lot of organizations. I won't read all the statistics here, but you can see um, what some people are saying when it comes to automating or to, when it comes to just managing sales tax. And this is, of course, from the Wakefield Research Study. 48% um, of people think the Rubik's Cube would be easier to master than the sales and use tax laws, which um, I find really, really amazing because I could never master the Rubik's Cube. 42% would rather go through a root canal than a sales tax audit. I mean, these are things that real people were saying in this um, Wakefield research study that how they feel about sales tax. Aside from how people feel about it, um, when it comes to raw numbers, the average cost of managing an audit is about $114,000. And that's a 19% increase over just a few years ago. So just to go through an audit, organizations are seeing that that's costing them real money on top of the struggles um, that they're experiencing when it, when it comes to managing sales tax. So some of the common sales tax misconceptions that people may see or that you may, may even think yourselves were too small to be audited. That's actually really not true. Auditors really don't care about how big your company is. It has to do more about what, they, what revenue potential they see within your organization for their state. Um, I'm a manufacturer. I don't collect sales tax. Um, my business is only in one state, so I don't have to collect sales tax anywhere else. That's actually a huge misconception. There are things now called the Amazon laws where there are economic nexus rules. And that just says that based on where you sell into a state or how much you sell into a state, you could automatically have an economic nexus because you sell over a threshold dollar amount into that state. Some states are as low as $25,000. Some are much higher. But that could actually give you nexus in a state, and you may not even know that. Um, we sell only to distributors or we've never been audited. Those are some of the common misconceptions and traps that people will tell themselves on why they don't need to do any more with sales tax than what they're doing today. Um, so just a couple of things about, you know, why, why complying with sales tax laws is, is such a challenge because sales tax, sales tax is a statutory requirement. Your company is required to um, collect and remit sales tax when you have nexus in a state. There are no benefits, um, there's no revenue generation in it for you, but it is a requirement and you do have to do it right. Um, companies are always at risk and many states are sharing company names. So just, you know, if you get audited by one state, they may share your name with another state, a neighboring state, and decide that, oh, hey, now the next state over is going to audit you. So you could always be at risk of an audit. And once you get on an audit cycle, you likely will be re-audited within several years. Also, audits um, frequently result in back taxes and penalties. So audits can stretch back anywhere from five to seven years as a look back period, and penalties can be anywhere from 30 to 120 percent. So you're not paying just whatever they find in terms of what you didn't collect in sales tax. They can assess that back five to seven years and tack on some penalties. So if there's a real compliance issue there. Um, in terms of why, what, what's challenging about the manual sales tax management? Well, it's labor intensive. There's a lot of time and effort put into that, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Human error can lead to inaccurate results, even just keying in the wrong rate 
or missing a rate change, something like that can be very um, can be very costly for you. And of course, the management of that in terms of the time and the risk can be very expensive. And like I said at the beginning, it's 100% non-revenue generating to you, but it is a requirement of the state. So let's talk about location. Why is location important when it comes to sales tax? So I've got this great quilt map here. This map is showing you all of the different taxing jurisdictions that are across the United States. So if we dig into that, there are over 12,000 tax jurisdictions in the United States. And that's a very astounding number um, for the number of states that we have. 150 million mailing addresses, and all of them can, you know, they're obviously in different taxing jurisdictions, and we'll drill into that in a minute. On top of that, you have product taxation. There's somewhere around 30 million products that we have to talk about how they're taxed within these taxing jurisdictions, because each product could be different based on the jurisdiction. And then, of course, you have your buyers, um, 750,000 plus or odd number of buyers and seller exemptions that you have to manage. So those are large numbers. That's a lot of stuff to take into consideration um, when you're talking about sales tax. So what people most commonly use when it comes to their ERP system or a NAV would be zip codes. And I want to talk about why zip codes are the wrong tool for the job. Zip codes were actually defined to be for mailing addresses for the U.S. Post Office, how to deliver your mail. They most certainly are not used for taxing jurisdictions. They are not at all similar. They're not lined up. Um, one zip code does not have the same um, tax code across that entire zip code, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, tax rates can actually vary quite significantly within a given zip code. So they really were used for just that, for mail delivery. And a lot of ERP systems only have the ability to do this within, um, you know, to do taxes within a specific zip code. They're doing it by, you know, an address and they're using a zip code. So let's drill down into why that doesn't work. So here is an area in Colorado. Um, you're looking about, you know, the Denver um, metropolitan area. So you can see Denver and some of the surrounding um, counties. So I'm going to drill into the Denver specific, Denver proper. You can see this circle. And here are some of the zip codes specifically within that area. So you can see I've got, what, six zip codes here that we're going to talk about. So let's look at just the 80111 zip code, Greenwood Village. Um, well, actually, I'll get to that in a minute. First, I just want to show you this different coloring. You can see here all the different colors are all of the different um, tax rates that could apply that are, you know, within there. So if you look at the 80111, you'll see that just that specific zip code has a number of different taxes represented. There's the state tax, the county taxes, there's Centennial City tax, a regional transportation tax, football district tax, and all of that is just very specific to that one zip code. But you'll see that within that zip code, um, different taxes will apply. So that whole zip code isn't all of those taxes, but some of those taxes make up, you know, different addresses in that zip code. So determining sales tax by zip code is very inaccurate and very risky. So to just drill into that one more time and to give you a better example, we're going to drill even closer into that, um, that Denver. We're going to just drill this map in specifically into an address in Denver. So you'll see we're kind of zooming in. And I want, to see, I want you to see here that there's one address here, 7450 Layden Street, and it's got a sales tax rate of 9.25%. You can see what makes that up. And then you can see the different coloring. You can see the kind of uh, light green to the gray. I'm going to pop up another address here that's in a different area. So the first one was in the gray. The next one is in the green. And you can see the difference is now 4.75% in tax. So one of the things that's missing here is that Commerce City tax. So these two addresses are actually very, very close to each other in proximity, but very, very different tax rates. And so this is why one of the main reasons why using a zip code is going to be very inaccurate and risky. And what we do, and I'll talk about this in a, in, a, in a little bit, is we really get down to the rooftop level to deliver you an accurate tax rate. So some taxability trouble. Um, aside from just the addresses that we talked about, zip codes, we also have pr product taxability. So I want to look at some things, and, and uh, you know, normally I would do a little quiz if, it, if we were in person here, but I'll just kind of walk through this with you. But if we talk about, I want to talk about the difference between sliced and whole bagels in New York, and then straws versus cups and lids in Colorado, and then these candy bars. So we, do we want to talk about what makes these different? So bagels in New York, let's talk about this first. In New York, if you have a whole bagel, it is exempt from tax. But once you slice it, it now becomes a prepared food. So that now becomes a taxable item. 
takeout beverages in Colorado. Your cups and lids are exempt because they're required to take a beverage outside. But if you want a straw, that's actually taxable because a straw is not required when it comes to taking out a beverage. So that becomes a taxable item. Candy bars in Indiana, now this is a fascinating one because you can think what would be different about candy bars? Why would a Nestle Crunch be different than a Kit Kat and a Twix? And what it has to do with is the amount or the content of flour, which um, based on their laws classifies a Kit Kat and a Twix as a food item instead of, can instead of a candy item. So what you have to ask yourself is, will Dynamics NAV take care of these types of product taxation, taxability things for you? Um, because this is very complex when you get down to the individual product level. Some other product taxability issues, again, as I talked about earlier, the rules and rates may vary between states. So what I just listed on the previous slides was very specific to a product and a state. Those same products will be taxed differently likely in another state. Um, the rules and the rates obviously can vary. Um, you know, in some states like Minnesota where I am, clothing items are non-taxable. Other states, they're taxable. And in even other states, they're taxable only once they exceed a certain dollar amount. Um, so, you know, you're gonna have different tax rates based on where you're shipping product to or where you have nexus. So the advantages to automation, really why is it important to start thinking about automation if we haven't, you know, kind of gotten you a little bit there already. Um, automating your sales tax can help you save time. It can increase your accuracy. Um, mitigates your risk, and of course will improve your efficiency and increase profitability. And so, and, and the increased profitability thing is really huge. You really wanna think about kind of what is your exposure, what is your risk if you were to have an audit? Because if you do find that you have missed some taxes, you don't get to go back and collect those from your customers. I mean, good luck. So I mean, that is really um, something that's coming off of your bottom line. You know, if you have to go ahead and, and get assessed sales tax um, fines and penalties. Um, if you're doing it today, some of the some of the compliance tasks that you're having to manage and some of the things that are that are really taking up the time and consuming your resources, somebody has to, of course, go out and determine first, do you have nexus in a state? Am I required to um, assess, collect, and remit taxes in the in a given state? And and you're gonna have to learn that you may have to look outside of the state that you're doing business in. Do you have remote employees? Um, do you have stuff in another warehouse. I mean, there's a lot of different things that can cause you to determine if you have nexus in another state. So first you have to determine that. And then you have to, you know, apply and register in that state. You have to figure out what the tax rates are in that state and set them up inside of your ERP system. Excuse me. And once that's done, you have to um, continue to manage and watch the rates, make sure that you're getting all the changes. You have to apply them to your products, apply them to your customers, dictate, uh, notate which customers are exempt. I mean, all of these different things. And then at the end, you have to run your reports, you have to tie it all out, and you have to, of course, remit your um, sales tax returns. So that's a lot, that can be a lot of time, very time consuming and very tedious. And aside from the fact that it can be tedious and time consuming, sometimes it's just plain hard. Um, if you were to go out and look at some of the, the sales tax or the state uh, websites and try to determine what their tax rate is, you could spend hours trying to just find out what their tax rates are in some cases or trying to decipher what the rules and regulations are within a given state. So um, when it comes to automation, of course, here at Avalara, we have, um, a, excuse me, <clears throat> our product called Avatax Calculations. I'm really sorry about that. And here's how it works. So basically you turn on a few settings inside of NAV. You, you, you know, the, the connector's already there. You just turn it on, you set up a few things, and then you start entering your orders or your invoices. And what's going to happen then is it's going to go ahead and read up to the Avatax cloud. It's going to look at information as to whether or not you have nexus in that state where the transaction is taking place. Is the customer exempt or not? Um, and if not, what is the tax rate? And it's going to return that. And all, all of that is going to happen within about four tenths of a second. So all the things that I just said, um, when your system sends that up to our cloud, that return is going to come back instantaneously to give you an accurate tax result every time. At the end of that process, we do have a returns um, piece, which I'll show you at the end, where if you'd like us to take care of your returns, all that is saved inside of our um, admin console. You can go and verify your returns for the month or the quarter, depending upon what you're doing, and we can go ahead and remit those directly to the proper authorities for you. So we can really take care of all of those things for you without you having to worry about what are the rules, what are the rates, 
what do I have to do with this product? We can take care of that all for you. Um, so like I said, for Avitax, for, for Dynamics Nav, maintain and up-to-date it's in the cloud so that stuff is always there there's not you know there's no updates that you have to do all the tax rates are there all the product taxability is there you would just map your products to our product taxability and then we of course have the state specific logic so what does this mean for you no more researching tax rates no more trying to find out what the rates are um, no more making sure that you catch the rate changes um, when they, those come down from legislation and you don't have to worry about assigning um, tax codes to customers we're going to take care of that like I said, at that address level, we're going to you know, find that rooftop location and get to that address level. So I wanna go ahead and, and show you a few things um, when it comes to this, but just give me a second, I'm gonna flip my screen. And Angie, can you confirm that you're now seeing my admin console? Yes, service notices, action alerts, or account alerts. Great, thank you. Yes, absolutely, thank you. So I just wanna spend a few minutes just talking to you a little bit about the Avalara admin console. Um, this is where you'll come to kind of check on everything and do some of the setup when it comes to Avalara. Of course, you know, you'll do all your transactions still, of course, in NAV, but this is where you can do a couple of other things. So since I don't have NAV right now, I do want to show you just our basic tax calculator. I'm going to go into tools and I'm just going to do a basic tax calculation. And there's a couple of things I want to, a couple of reasons I want to show this to you. Um, the first is because one of the things that we don't talk about often enough, in my opinion, is that we do address validation as well. And we do address validation because address validation is very important when it comes to tax. So if I just type in um, 114 West 40th, New York, New York, and I hit at validate, you're gonna see that it's gonna come back with um, the proper address. It added the street, it gave me the zip code, and it gave me the latitude and longitude. So it's giving me that rooftop location for that specific address. So if you, go, if you buy Avitax, you will get address validation automatically, which helps in delivery of your products, no more you know, return of products, but it also is going to help get accurate sales tax calculations. And then you can see here, if I type in $100 um, and I go ahead and hit calculate, you're gonna see over on the right-hand side the results of my sales tax for that location. So it's telling you on $100, I have $8.88 of tax, and it's giving you the breakdown of what, where those taxes come from. So I have my New York state tax, I have my city tax, and I have a special metropolitan commuter tax. So these are all the taxes that are assessed given this specific address. So um, again, if you were to do this in NAV, of course, you'd get the same thing, type in a different address, get a different result, but, um, but you'll see exactly how that works. All the transactions that you um, complete within NAV are gonna be stored inside this transactions area. And the nice thing about this is if we drill into one of these transactions, you'll be able to kind of see exactly what taxes were assessed. So I'm just drill drilling into a transaction that was created. You'll see I have my document ID and, and document date and some other information. And this probably doesn't make any sense to you because this is done within our system. But you'll also see the taxes that were assessed on that transaction. So for that line item, I have, what does this look like, $100,000. And then I had um, Florida State and then Florida County, Pinellas, Ca Pinellas County tax assessed here. So you can see the different tax rates and how much of that was taxable and how much was non-taxable in this transaction. So you'll see that for Pinellas County, 95,000 of this was non-taxable and 5,000. I don't know exactly what the rule was or what product code they used. Um, I think it was a tangible, tangible personal property code, but you'll see that it is basically determining which, determining which pieces of this are taxable and which are not. So you can get down to that at the very, um, a very detailed transaction level um, and you can see what happened on every transaction. So if you ever have to look back, you'll be able to see what it was. And finally, um, when it comes to returns, like I mentioned, we can also do tax returns for you. The nice thing here is you can go ahead and look and see um, if you, in a given state, let's just pick Colorado because we've been picking on them all day. As long as I don't freeze up here. Um, and you can see a couple of things here. So 
If you choose to do returns with us, the nice thing here is that we will give you all the information here. You just simply tie this out to your liability account in NAB, um, make sure it matches, and then you can go ahead and approve. So you'll see one of these is approved to file and one of them is pending approval. You'll also see this little um, kind of dial here. So you'll see the first one, this return um, is actually a monthly return, whereas the other one here is a quarterly return. So it's gonna tell you exactly how often these returns take place. Um, and then once they're approved, we'll go ahead and do one ACH transaction out of your account, and we will submit the returns and payment to all of the proper authorities at the right time. So you have this nice approval area where you can go ahead and look at your um, at your amounts, validate them, make sure everything's good to go, and then you can go ahead and submit those returns. So I think that's all I wanted to show you. I didn't want to get into great detail in the admin council. Um, again, you will be doing the majority of your transactions within NAB, but I just wanted to show you that piece of it. And with that, I'm going to hop back over to the slideshow, which we're actually done with, but I just want to see if anybody has any questions. So I'm going to open the floor up um, and see if anybody has any questions. Yes, Stacy. Do I have to change any of my current Microsoft processes to use Avalara? Good question. Um, no, Angie, in, in terms of what you would be doing, what you're doing today in NAV or what you're doing tomorrow with Avatax, everything is exactly the same. Um, so you would just go ahead and enter the transaction per normal and the rate would get returned um, when you save that transaction. So nothing would change within your process. Good question. Okay, great. And then when taxability rules or tax boundaries change, do I need to do anything to update my tax schedules? That's another great question. And, and no, the answer is no, you don't have to. And that's the nice thing is we have a team of people dedicated to the different states that are, that are constantly taking care of rules and boundaries and changes. And that's all being updated in the cloud. And that is also the benefit to you as a customer in the cloud you don't have to make any changes, and that is being changed instantaneously on the cloud. So if something changes or becomes effective on July 1st, that's kind of the time, the most recent time when a lot of tax changes took place. Um, on July 1st, you can rest assured that when you start entering transactions, any new rates, boundaries, um, tax code changes, anything like that have already been set up in the system and you're all good to go. Good question. Okay, sounds good. Thank you very much for the presentation. I see. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, and thank you all for attending. Okay. Well, thank you all for attending, and um, like I said before, this will be this is recorded, and it will be available on our website uh, later this afternoon at Inovia.com. And again, thank you, Stacy, for presenting, and we hope to see you. On our next webinar, uh, which is going to be next week, September 12th, and it's going to be about electronic payments and positive pay. How much easier can it get? So thank you again, everyone. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, you.